Hi, I'm Jake. I make RPG supplements and videos about Pathfinder 2, or PF2, and other systems, maybe in the RPG news, whatever. Lots of news about TTRPGs, tater pigs. So, Thaumaturge. The Thaumaturge is a really cool class. I love them, but it's because of the theme. I love the idea of you're doing this dark, scary, mind-bending occult research, learning about all these different kinds of creatures and magic, which allows you to kick their asses. I love that a smart person can do well in combat. That's the basis of this class. They're basically a melee fighter. I guess you don't have to be melee, but they're a fighter type. They're a marshal. They're a marshal class. I'm going to mention a couple of things at the outset that are the main abilities of the Thaumaturge. And then I'm going to skip right to the implements because the implements are the subclasses, basically. You can mix and match them a little bit, like you pick up additional implements later. And then I'm going to go over a few of the feats. Only a few of the feats because, well, most people don't get to high levels. And some of the feats are like their own video. Like, I have a video on the ritualist and rituals. And there, I mentioned in there something about the Thaumaturge because they have just a feat that makes them a ritualist. That'll be at the end of this video. So obviously, there's not going to be a lot of info about the feats on this one. But I am also going to go over the archetypes. How each archetype can be useful for the Thaumaturge, and how the Thaumaturge's archetype can be useful for some classes. Not every class. Some classes. Like witches, because it totally fits the theme, and I love both of them, and that's what I'm going to play. A Thaumaturge gets a bonus to Charisma. It's their base stat, but that's primarily because their main ability, Esoteric Lore, adds Charisma as a lore skill, so you need the Charisma to be able to recall knowledge to beat the crap out of enemies. I'll get to that in a second, though. I want to mention that the skills they get are, they automatically are trained in Arcana, Nature, Occultism, and Religion, and they're trained in a number of additional skills equal to 3 plus their intel Intelligence modifier, which is great. They're all knowledgey. However, they are still a Marshal. They get one more lore, it's Esoteric Lore. I'm going to read most of this to you, because it, it, you need to know how it works, and it's fun. Esoteric lore. Your experience with the unknown, as well as the tales you've exchanged with other thaumaturges, has taught you about strange phenomena of every kind. You become trained in esoteric lore, a special lore skill that can be used to recall knowledge regarding haunts, curses, and creatures of any type, but that can't be used to recall knowledge of other topics unless you take a feat later on. Unlike a normal lore skill, you use charisma as your modifier on esoteric lore checks. You also gain the dubious knowledge skill feat, which most people don't seem to like. The dubious knowledge skill feat means that if you fail a knowledge check, or sorry, a uh, recall knowledge check, then you get one piece of wrong information and one piece of right information, and you have to decide which is which. I guess that could be fun thematically if your DM's good at lying to you, but most aren't. So just, I don't know. I would personally probably replace it with something else that's just more useful. I don't know, spirit sense? Esoteric lore is used primarily with the next ability, exploit vulnerability. It can be used outside of combat, theoretically, but it's mostly used for this. So exploit vulnerability, I'm going to read you the beginning part, but not all the successes. So exploit vulnerability, one action. You can use it once per round. You have to be holding your implement, so your subclass thingy has to be in your hand. You scour your experiences and learning to identify something that might repel your foe. You retrieve an object from your esoterica with the appropriate supernatural qualities. Then use your implement to stoke the remnants of its power into a blaze. Pause. Your esoterica are random little bits and bobs all over your, your clothing or in your pocket. It's just, it's like, you know that werewolves are vulnerable to silver. So you pull out some like silver filings. You just have random crap on you. That's really just a story explanation for how the abilities work. It's kind of considered that you always have them with you. Like, you have a, a piece of cord from the noose of a hanged man. Because you needed it. Right. But if you're, like, captured and all of your stuff is taken away, 
it says in here that you can't use your esoterica. So you can't use things that are related to it, like exploit vulnerability. Fine. It, it, it's just fill in the blank reason for a cool special effect. Using exploit vulnerability, select a creature you can see and attempt an esoteric lore check against a standard DC first level as you retrieve the right object from your esoterica and use your implement to empower it. You gain the following effects until you exploit vulnerabilities again. So the critical failure result is you're just like searching everywhere for this esoteric thing that's supposed to help them. Like I, I have this iron nail that's supposed to help. I don't know where the hell I put it though. And you just lose your action. That sucks. The best result is critical success. You learn all of the creature's resistances, weaknesses, and immunities, including the amounts of the resistances and weaknesses and any unusual weaknesses or vulnerabilities. So like everything. This is a great skill that like kind of everybody wants because you need to know what the hell you're fighting. And so using this ability, if the monster that you're rolling against, assuming it's a monster, has a specific weakness to something, like uh, they're uh, vulnerable to holy damage, or silver, or iron, or I don't know, redwood, then you just say you have that thing on you, and you use that in combination with whatever the hell weapon you're using, or punching, to do extra damage. The extra damage is always equal to their weakness amount, whatever that is. Like for some demons, it's like five or 25, depending on how high level you are. If they don't have an innate weakness, you, it says you improvise a custom weakness on a creature by forcefully presenting and empowering a piece of esoterica that repels it on an individual level, which is another just bullshit explanation for saying, I hate that thing. That means that you always do, you give them a weakness against your unarmed and weapon strikes equal to two plus half your level. Okay, so no matter what, you do a little bit of extra damage, at least with esoteric lore. Cool. Aside from the weakness that you give a creature, so you do extra damage, you also have an ability called Implements Empowerment, which means that you shake your little death rattle or whatever, um, at your weapon or your fist, whatever you're using to strike with, and that weapon or fist, whatever, does extra damage. Equal to two. Just cause. Cool, so this is how you can be a martial character with charisma. You can only use a one-handed weapon though because you have to hold your implement. And I, you punch or you stab or shoot or whatever so you're always doing a little bit less damage but then you increase it by using the implements empowerment which doesn't take an action it's just a thing you do and by giving them oh by using exploit vulnerability on the target so this is how you can be like kick ass in combat now i'm skipping directly to the implements because that's really what this video is about because it, they're complicated implements the reason you take thaumaturge either as a main class or as an archetype this is why you're doing it there are nine implements there are three that have reactive abilities three that have passive abilities and three that take an action to use on your turn no matter what they all require a hand to use it's, it's keeping to the you have to have a one-handed weapon to be able to play this class in combat it's an interesting management of resources. Implements get more powerful at different levels. So at first level, it has the base ability and then it gains additional powers at 7th, 9th, and 17th. So I'll mention all of those briefly, but mostly I only care about the first level ones. Partly because if you're taking the Thaumaturge as an archetype, you're only going to get access to the first level for the most part. Now the first implement, amulet, because it's an amulet. So amulet, the first level ability, the initiate ability, is a reaction called amulet's abeyance. 
if the target of your exploit vulnerability, the thing you used esoteric lore on, would damage you or an ally of yours within 15 feet of you, as a reaction, you can give resistance to all of the triggering damage equal to 2 plus your level. So you can prevent a little bit of damage as a reaction. Obviously, this is going to be useful most of the time if you're primarily a thaumaturge. As you go up in level, using the amulet, it either has a lingering protection on a person or also gives that person plus two to their AC and saves against the person you exploited. Weird way to put it. And eventually you gain the ability to prevent damage to all of your allies within 15 feet. So the amulet's just all about protection. That's all it does, but it's useful. And the next implement. Yeah. The bell is my favorite implement. Its reaction is great. As a reaction, you use the ability called Ring Bell. Shocker. What it does depends on the triggering action. So it's either going to be your enemy that you have targeted with esoteric lore is making a strike or casting a spell. They have to be within 30 feet of you. If they are casting a spell, you ring a bell and they have to make a fortitude save against your class DC or become stupefied one until the end of your next turn, which screws over spell casting. And they had to roll fortitude, which casters usually suck at. The other ability is if they're making a strike. So they're probably some sort of martial class. The target must succeed at a will save against your class DC or become your choice of enfeebled one or clumsy one. Or a critical failure it increases to two on each of those. So the martial person has to make a will save, which they usually suck at, and you can choose to penalize their strength or dexterity, essentially. Great! This is always useful as long as you're within 30 feet of your enemy and you don't have any other reactions. So this is also another great option for archetype mixing in. You see why people take Thaumaturge as an archetype often? Because you just get one thing that does something great. It's just picking up a tool. As you increase in level, further abilities of the bell implement are the negative condition lasts for up to three rounds instead of one. The target of the ring bell ability takes a minus two penalty to future saves against the ring bell ability. Or the negative condition values are increased to two or three on a critical failure. Again, that's all it does is it interrupts people and kind of makes them screwed over. But that's awesome. Pretty. Pretty. Ow! I love stuff like this. The chalice implement. Okay. The chalice is the first active implement we have. Once per round, you can take an action if you're holding the chalice implement, obviously. You can use this on yourself or an adjacent ally. There are two abilities it has. Sip gives that person temporary hit points equal to two plus half your level that lasts until the end of your next turn. The Drain ability instead heals that person of three hit points for each level you have, but then the Drain ability can't be used for 10 minutes again on anybody. Obviously, it's great for out of combat healing, but it's also useful for in combat if there's a panic button you need to press. The, the temporary hit points are like, okay, but you have to be adjacent to that person or you do it to yourself. I mean, I, obviously, you can do it to yourself, and that's useful because you're a martial character. You need the hit points. The later abilities of the chalice are things like you prevent a little bit of extra damage if that person has recently taken a critical hit from a slashing or piercing weapon, or bleed damage. Persistent bleed damage. Or they heal a little bit more, or you can remove some conditions from them. That's a 17th level. Mm. Obviously, I'm not a fan of the chalice. Yes, it's sometimes useful. It seems so boring to me. 
And that's sort of the best reason I will ever have to say don't do something, because it's boring. <laughs> a lot of these implements can be whatever you'd like them to be. They just have to sort of fit the theme. So if you find a magical item later on that also fits that kind of item, then you can take a day out and rededicate it, sort of, as your new implement. Next implement, the lantern. The first ability is it's a lantern. So it shines brightly for 20 feet and tw has 20 feet of dim light after that. It's magical, so it has the evocation, light, and magical traits. It gives plus one to all perception checks for all of your party members, for anything that the light shines on, and recall knowledge checks against creatures within the bright light as well. The most interesting part for me about this is during exploration, even if you aren't searching, the GM rolls a secret check for you to find traps, environmental hazards, haunts, and secrets, such as secret doors. For some characters, that's amazing. Granted, you have to be wielding a bright light, and that kind of sucks if you're a sneaky character. But if you don't care about hiding, you can find traps. Like, seriously, if you don't have a rogue in your party, or an archaeologist, it'd be very helpful to have somebody that has a lantern. I mean, this lantern, not just like a lantern. As you go up in level, the lantern's power increases. Like usual, it increases its radius of light, both bright and dim. And it allows you to see through illusions or eventually transmutations. It gives higher bonuses to use perception and lore checks to the things in the area. And that's it. Wow, that's that's amazing. Okay. The mirror implement. It says here, thaumaturges always choose small, portable, handheld mirrors as implements so they can use them easily while adventuring. This might be on the big side. The mirror is an active implement. It takes one action to use on your turn. It uses mirror's reflection, or the ability is called mirror's reflection. What it does is it creates a copy of you 15 feet away in any direction, including up, I guess. Um, it acts as an exact duplicate of you and does everything that you do. In fact, you can also use that image to attack, seek, and provide flanking, even with yourself. For all purposes, you are in both squares until the beginning of your next turn. If you choose to move from your square, then you can choose that you move from either square, as they're both you. When you move, whether it's from your own square or the mirror reflection square, it destroys the reflection. This is basically, like, it's complicated to do and takes a bunch of actions, but it's basically a teleport. Little teleport, mini port. If there's an area of effect, you only have to save once. You don't, like, take damage both times. That's pretty much what it does. At higher levels, Mirror's Reflection does a couple of other things. Uh, the next level is if somebody is next to your copy when it disappears, you can make it shatter and deal damage in a five foot emanation equal to two plus half your level or the damage of the triggering attack, whichever is lower. Interesting. You're immune to the damage. There's no saving throw. They just take damage in that area. Unfortunately, so do your friends if they're right next to the image. So don't do that. The next higher up ability is whenever you use your esoteric lore on somebody, exploiting vulnerability, then you are concealed to that person. There's no other action or attack needed. There's, there's nothing. There's no saving throw. Just you're concealed to them. Cool. When you use Mirror's Reflection at a higher level, 17th, you can have one of yourselves immediately interact, seek, or strike. So really all of this is about the beginning ability and using tactics that would help you if you had an extra one of you or teleporting 15 feet. I wish you could expand or increase this range. There are no feats that a thaumaturge has that allows that. And it's not based on your speed. It's just 15 feet. 
maybe you could like homebrew something that's a feat that increases it by five feet or something that would be worth taking to me the next implement is a bit odd it's regalia now when i think of regalia i think royal robes a crown regalia implements represent rulership leadership and social connections it's not it's something handheld that doesn't make sense to me i would say that it could be something that you're wearing and it just uses a hand who cares why because mechanics but it can look cool that way and it's not just something handheld that you can go fear me i have the regalia this thing is means i'm in command yeah i don't know maybe you could just use a d20 because they're pretty while they differ in shape depending on regional customs and markers used to signify authority, common regalia implements are scepters, jeweled orbs, and heraldic banners. Wouldn't that be heraldic? Whatever. Regalia implements are associated with the hero suit of blah blah blah, who cares, we're not covering hero today. I'm sadly going to have to read a big chunk of regalia because it just does several minor things, and I have to tell you what each of them are. Alright. While you hold your regalia, you gain an air of authority and bolster the courage of allies who believe in you. When you use Deception, Diplomacy, or Intimidation, you get plus one circumstance bonus. Allies can, who can see you can use Follow the Expert to follow you even if you're only trained in a skill and not an expert due to the competence you clearly exude. When they do, the circumstance bonus they gain from following the Expert is plus one. When you're holding the regalia, you gain an inspiring aura that stokes the courage of you and all allies in a 15-foot emanation who can see you, granting them a plus one status bonus to saving throws against fear. At the end of your turn, at the same time you would reduce your frightened value by one, you reduce the frightened value of all allies within your inspiring aura by one. That's the reason I would take this. Yeah, it does other social things. Fine. That's, that's not what I would care about it for. I love the idea of it being a defensive aura. It, like you have a little bit of paladin mixed into whoever that's that's neat that's useful just passively even though you have to have a hand you really do have to have a hand busy all the time oh and the hand that holds an implement can also be used for esoterica really just the word esoterica means nothing it, it's not even a physical thing really it, it doesn't matter you just make the check and you have a thing to validate making the check I know I said that before, but it's silly. At higher levels, you increase the bonuses that you get to deception, diplomacy, and intimidation, and the bonuses other people get to following the expert if you're doing a thing. And the plus one versus fear helps all of your allies on all saving throws. Awesome. And you give all of them and yourself plus two status bonus to damage rolls. And that bonus number of damage increases as you go up in level two. Also, at ninth level, you can give allies a plus one or plus two if you hit or critically hit an enemy. Cool. At 17th level, a lot of minor stuff. If you roll a critical failure on a check to coerce, make an impression, or request, you get a failure instead. When others use follow the expert to follow you, you grant them a plus three circumstance bonus if you are trained, or plus four if you are an expert or above. Allies in your inspiring aura aren't flat-footed from being flanked unless you too are flanked. If one of your allies in the aura is clumsy and feeble, frightened, sickened, or stupefied, the status penalty your ally takes from the condition is one lower than the condition's value as long as the ally remains on the aura, unless you too are affected by the same condition. Just passive helping people around you. That's cool. Okay. You're a little, you're a little bitty paladin. Little pally baby. The next implement. Book. Tome. At the lowest level, it gives you plus one on all recall knowledge checks, but that includes esoteric lore. So it helps you kick more ass in combat a little. Cool. Also, during your, during your daily preparations, you gain the trained proficiency rank in two skills of your choice until you prepare again. That's really nice. And a class that already gets a bunch of skills, you get more skills. This is a very useful implement if you know you're going to need a variety of skills. And frankly, some GMs are unpredictable. So it might be nice to be able to switch out your skills every day. At higher levels, you get a free recall knowledge attempt at the beginning of your round about a creature you're observing. If that is successful, you get plus one to hit them next time you try to hit them. At level higher than that, 
you get to roll a d20 and set it aside and use that to hit that creature that turn if you want to. It's sort of like having a little bit of investigator in your thaumaturge. Also, at the highest level, while holding your tome, you can always roll a skill check for initiative against creatures or haunts using esoteric lore. If you do, you get plus three. Cool. The tome is just boring. I mean, yeah, okay. It's 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 useful. I just it's not fun or flashy or I don't know. It's not all magic y. It's a no stuff. When this class is already a no stuff. I don't need more a no stuff. On top of a no stuff. The next implement is wand. This is probably the least useful of all of the implements, even though I've said some of them are boring. The wand is basically a damage cantrip. Okay, so I'll explain. When you take the wand implement, you have to choose cold electricity or fire. You gain fling magic as an ability. It takes two actions. You fling magic at an enemy within 60 feet. It does 1d4 plus your charisma modifier to the target with a basic reflex save against your class DC. It's a cantrip. The damage is of the type that you chose when you selected this implement and you can't change it. Ever. At third level and every two levels thereafter, the damage increases by 1d4. If you want to, you can change those d4s to d6s during one round. And then you have to wait 1d4 rounds for it to recharge, but during that time you can still do d4s. So, like, you enter a combat, and you use your wand as d6s, and then you do something else. Because this is a martial class. Your abilities are based on strikes. This is not a strike. It's... I'm sorry. It's not... It doesn't, it doesn't meld well with the class. It's a fun option. And at higher levels, you, you can make it an AoE. So it does a 20-foot burst. Cool. At level 17. It's, it's just not... I mean, it's fun, but that's all it is. At higher levels, you get, like, a little negative penalty rider on the damage if you chose cold. The target, if they fail saves and whatever, they take minus 10 foot status penalty to its speeds for one round. Electricity, they're shocked, making them flat-footed. Fire, they catch fire, dealing 1d10 persistent fire damage, which is kind of cool. 2d10 on a critical failure and that increases as you go up in levels and you can also use your exploit vulnerability on a target to do an extra one plus the number of damage dice and damage to that one target is not mm -mm. Nah. the next implement is a weapon because this is a weapon i hope i didn't break any kitties <clears throat> The weapon is, you're a fighter. Okay, not completely, but it's cool. Um, you get implements interruption as a reaction. The trigger is the target of your exploit vulnerability, uses a concentrate manipulator move action or leaves a square during a move action is using. So you're basically doing a reactive strike and you're trying to interrupt their activity. It sucks that it only works for who you, whoever you've already targeted with your exploit vulnerability and just that person. That's the big restriction here but as far as its effects really useful if you critically hit with your implements interruption your reactive strike as a thumb charge then you interrupt their activity whatever it was it was a concentrate manipulate or move action or leaving a square during a move action it's using <laughs> all right so it's it's only against one target but against that one target it's amazing it, it's, it's, it's as good as the fighter's reactive strike. Seventh level ability of the weapon is if you use your reactive strike thingy, your implements interruption, and you miss, you still, do, still deal a point of damage, which can trigger weaknesses. So that demon I mentioned earlier that has a weakness of 25 to something, you do 26 damage to him because you missed. That's cool. All right, it's not always useful, but it's a nice little perk. Ninth level, you get plus two to hit against your target of your exploit vulnerability. Vulnerability. So you're better at fighting one-on-one. -on -one. At 17th level, whenever you hit with this reaction, you always interrupt whatever they're doing. You don't have to critically hit anymore. It's at 17th, so it's appropriate for its level. So overall, the weapon is useful. If you're planning on being in melee, I don't know why you wouldn't take it. 
especially if you have a weird gimmicky weapon like a frying pan. Thank you for watching this section. Um, we're going to be cutting here and putting out a second video. I'll mention that again in a moment. And thank you to our lovely patron people. I do release unique videos on Patreon, do giveaways, and our top level patrons get one-on-one -on -one time with me every month. I just basically make whatever they want to. I mean, one thing of whatever they want. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing anything else. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, if you want to make sure to catch the next video I make, hitting the subscribe button is a good way to bookmark the page. I, that's how I use bookmark, that's how I use the subscribe button anyway. It's just handy. Anyway, um, like, share, comment, do something like that to, or all of them to tell the algorithm gods that I don't suck. At least not that much. And also, I mentioned earlier, the ritualist videos and rituals are going to be here. And also for the second part of this video, as soon as it's done, it's going to appear right here. Okay. Okay, thanks. Bye. See you in a moment. Ew. Ew. Ew.